morning. Great to see you today. After daylight savings time, trust me, it's great to see you today. Um, glad you're here. Um, just if you didn't know it was that saving times, you're not, for, you're not halfway through the first service. This is actually the second service. And, um, but we're so glad you're here. Thank you for joining us online, those of you guys that are looking and watching in and, and worshiping. Pray God blesses you right where you are. Um, and so uh, the, the ladies are at the women's retreat this weekend. Some of them are, are, are there. Um, there's, yesterday there were probably 70 or so ladies there. And so they're finishing up this morning. So uh, just pray for them and ask God's blessing as they wrap up uh, this weekend, which I understand has been very, very good uh, time together. And um, God's doing some awesome things, as you know, in our church. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the fact that we're completely debt-free now as a result of the Greater 2020 campaign. Yeah, yeah, I know you all have heard about that probably by now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just some cool things. And uh, CR, Celebrate Recovery, started last Monday night. Uh, fabulous turnout, about 40 people for that first night of Celebrate Recovery. Yeah, so that's awesome. So, so thankful for the folks who've been really praying and devoting the last seven months to launching that. And uh, I believe God's going to use that. And he is using that in a big way to set people free. And uh, I started my Wednesday night New Testament survey class. We had like 30 folks there for that. You're welcome to still come if you want to kind of dive into the New Testament and survey that, uh, the, the New Testament. And then, uh, and God's blessing in so many ways, it's crazy. Like you may have, some of you may have seen the picture, but uh, Danny, who was our intern who was here from Honduras last week, he, Monday was his last day. Pastor Bob took him fishing and uh, first time he'd ever been fishing and he caught uh, a 14, probably a 14 pound, we don't know exactly how much it weighed, but about a 14 pound bass. Um, so he was excited about that. And so awesome final day. And then yesterday, yesterday, uh, Pastor Cody and Bob went to a bass fishing tournament and placed second. So, I mean, all I'm saying is like, all I'm saying is like, if you're a fisherman and you go to Bayside, you need to get on the water like <laughs> ASAP because <laughs> they're practically jumping in the boat is what I'm telling you. So, uh, but God is good, man, and we are so excited for what he's doing and the breakthroughs that are happening all over the place right now, man. If you, um, you want to get more involved, it's a great time to get involved beyond just Sunday morning. Get in a group, get serving, um, get connected, come to CR, uh, get in a, small, in a, a study class on Wednesday night, man. It, you just will sense even more so what God is doing at our church and through us, and, uh, and it's exciting. Amen? Yeah. All right, well, we're going to dive into the fourth uh, of the Beatitudes this morning, and so in this series called B, and it's really looking at those Beatitudes, which are the sort of diamond of this sermon that was preached by Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, but the introduction of that sermon, uh, that iconic sermon, are the Beatitudes, and they just, they, they're, they're, uh, they're timeless, and they are something that many books have been written about, many sermons have been preached because they are just so filled with truth and shocking truth, honestly, about what God is looking for and what constitutes a blessed person. And so the first week we talked about the first beatitude, which is blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about the fact that it's when we come to the place where we acknowledge and admit that we can't save ourselves, that we uh, don't have the resources to redeem and to fix ourselves, that we are poor, we are poverty, we have a poverty of spirit. When we admit that, then we turn to God and we experience all the resources that are available to us uh, through his kingdom. And so then we find healing and restoration and wholeness. The second week we talked about blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And the idea there is not just that we intellectually admit that we are poor in spirit, that it's sort of just a cognitive uh, ascent, but it's, we own it, we feel it, we mourn our brokenness, we mourn our lostness, we mourn our sinfulness, we mourn that fact that we are poor, that we have made mistakes. And when we own it, the great hope of the Beatitudes of Jesus' words, the hope is that we will be comforted that there's someone who will come to our rescue. There's someone who will come to our help. He will comfort us when we own it. Then last week we talked about blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. We talked about the fact that meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is when we harness our agenda for God's agenda. 
when we harness, when we yield our agenda to what God wants to do and to others. That's meekness. And when we are willing to do that, when we're able to put others first, God moves in amazing, amazing ways in our lives. So today we come to the fourth, which is um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for, their, for they will be filled. So when we think about this beatitude, hung, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, there's a couple of questions immediately that kind of come to mind to, to make sense of this beatitude. The first is, what is righteousness? <laughs> those who hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness, they will be filled. Well, what's righteousness? Well, righteousness is, is this desire for what is right. It's, it's, it's this desire to, to be right with God, to be right with God. It's also a desire for rightness, justice, socially with people. So it's a, a vertical uh, justice and righteousness right before God, but it's a being, a, being right with others. It's an internal righteousness that I want to be right in my own heart before God, but I also want to be right with others. So a way to illustrate this is, uh, you know, imagine, you know, all of us lost an hour last night, right? So imagine someone next to you was, you know, blaring loud music till three o'clock in the morning. And suppose hypothetically you didn't kill them. But now you call the authorities because your request for them to turn it down don't work. So you finally have to call the authorities and the authorities come out and they, you know, say, look, you're going to have to turn your, the music down. And if they refuse, there's some sort of, you know, citation. So now they turn the music down. And so they realize that, you know, hopefully by the, the authorities doing that, they help them make them aware that, you know, you, you got to be aware of other people. You got to be aware of the feelings and the, the situations and the, the needs of other people. And so there's, a, there's internal awareness that by the authorities coming out, I hope it, you know, jogs their memory. And so maybe that's right. They figure out, yeah, you know what? That was a terrible thing for me to do. They, maybe they're very remorseful, very remorseful for what they've done. Do you get your hour back? Do you get your time back? No. So there's an, another part of justice where it's like, okay, yeah, that's fine that you're good now and you came to this greater awareness, but I, I don't get my sleep back. And this desire to make things right, that someone's going to eventually and can even the scales. And we have... And, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, who hunger for justice, not only that, they're, that they might be made right with God, which is very, very important, but also that things around them might be made right and places where they've hurt other people, they might be able to make it right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So righteousness. And the second thing we notice about this beatitude is it's, Future oriented, isn't it? How many of you know, like yes, like yesterday's lunch will not help you in another hour, right? Like yesterday's lunch, like you don't you don't hunger for yesterday's lunch, do you? You hunger for today's, for the next thing. You hunger for the future. Hunger is a, is a is a current need that you want filled that will satisfy you in the future. It's, it's future-oriented. So Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who are oriented towards the future, they hunger for righteousness. They hunger and they thirst for righteousness. They look towards the future. But how many of you know, it's a great mystery to figure out, like, how do you create spiritual hunger? Maybe you have someone in your life, and you're like, Man, I just wish they desired the things of God. Have you ever said that? I just wish they desired the things of God. I wish they hungered. I wish they cared about godly things. I wish they, and, and you, you're like, how do you, how do you create that hunger in someone? Well, the short answer is you can't. <laughs> because honestly, some of us have tried. <laughs> we dropped Bibles everywhere and little verses. We put verses on the mirrors. We told them how terrible they were. That worked great. Church is filled with people who've been told how terrible they are, right? No, that doesn't work. 
So, so how do you do that? How do you create hunger? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So we need to ask the question, what creates hunger and how do we get to that place? And this morning, I, I hope that we can create hunger for righteousness. So how do you do that? Well, to hunger for righteousness, you've got to take out what's already in your stomach that isn't hungering for righteousness. And what is in most of our stomachs and what is in the pit of most people's stomachs is guilt. You say, I don't know, Terry, I, I came to the wrong service because I got no guilt. I got no guilt. If, imagine this. If you walked in this morning and I would have handed you a piece of paper and all it said on it, I just kind of slipped it in your coat pocket or handed it to you and it just said, they know it all. All of it. Some of you have said, oh, crap. <laughs> Because you have guilt. There's something there, like, whoa, I don't even know what, but I, suddenly I feel guilty. You know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> but to get to the future, to have a hunger for the future, you've got to get rid of the guilt. This gnawing guilt that is inside of us. In fact, there was a study in 2017 that was done that said on average, the average person has 13 secrets that they're holding back, five of which they've never told a living soul. That's the average. I'm just looking around. Some of us got a closet full then, right? Like if most of us are, then some are carrying a lot. Five, that they've never told a living soul. And, you know, we talk about how guilt weighs us down. It literally does. Do you know, like they did studies with people who felt guilty and, and had them, like, uh, look at the, 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 the incline of a mountain and then the distance of, of a road or distance of a street. And those who had guilt overestimated how high it was and how far it was over and over again. Because they were weighted with this, like, that's a long way. That's really, really high. Because they're weighted with guilt. Do you know the Bible said that way before scientific studies? <laughs> Psalm 38 verse 4 says, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. If you want healing, you've got to deal with the guilt. You've got to deal with the shame that you're carrying. James chapter 5 Verse 16 says, confess your sins one to another so that you might be healed, so that you can be healed. And the next verse, which we love, is the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or righteous person avails much. We love that verse because that's about me and God. If I'm righteous and effective, I can achieve much through prayer. Read one before that. That says, confess your sins to each other so that you might be healed, so that you might get rid of this burden, this guilt, this shame that you're carrying. You see, guilt chains us to the past. We can't hunger for the future. We can't hunger and thirst for righteousness when the guilt and shame is chaining us to the past. So for healing, guilt from the past must give way to a hunger for righteousness. For healing, guilt from the past must give way to a hunger for righteousness. The good news is that, that, there, is that there is relief. There is relief from the guilt. But let's talk about what guilt does. The first thing guilt does is it erodes my confidence. When we're guilty, it erodes your confidence. I've shared bits and pieces and over, over time about, you know, days leading Bayside in the early days, those first three years were difficult and painful and how, you know, most days for many days feeling like a failure, like you're a failure, you're letting yourself down, you're letting your family down, you're letting people who believed in you down, you're letting leadership down, you're letting the community down. You just, days I would wake up feeling like a total failure. 
and go to sleep at night feeling like a total failure. And you know what happens when you feel like a total failure in the shame and the guilt and the, the remorse? It eroded my confidence. I, it eroded my confidence. I, I, it was, it was, it, you, you, you feel, you, you almost hope no one sees you, right? So you can just kind of sneak in and sneak out and do your thing. Guilt will erode your confidence. If you're looking at your life right now and you're thinking, why don't I have confidence? Why don't I feel, why don't I feel like I can do things? Why don't I feel assertive? Why don't I feel like I can go for it? Why don't I feel like I can step out? Why, can't I feel like, why don't I feel like God's got me? I want, I want you to seriously consider whether or not you have shame and guilt. Because it's that internal accusation of the enemy that says you're not worthy, you're no good. No one wants you. It eats away at your confidence. It will erode your confidence. Second thing is it, does, it does is it damages relationships. It damages relationships. When, 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 I lack, when I feel guilt and shame, it will damage relationships. You ever been around someone who like, they blow up at things that really are disproportionate? Like they bring a, uh, an, a machine gun to a uh, knife fight <laughs> kind of thing. You know, it's like, it's this minor issue and it just an explosion. I want to tell you, when you see that, there's probably some guilt going on in there. There's some guilt and there's some shame. It's a guilt alert. <laughs> because it will damage relationships. It will cause us to overreact with anger. It will also, when there's shame, it'll cause us to indulge and enable people. You've seen this before, right? Like this happens sometimes in, in divorce situations where a parent or both parents kind of maybe feel guilty about the failure of the marriage. And so what do they do? They just, just pour gifts on the kids, right? They, they gift them. Every time they see them, they got a new gift, a bigger gift, a better gift, a gift better than what the other one gave them, right? And so what, what's, but if the root of it is what? A sense of guilt, a sense of shame. And we tend to enable people when we, uh, when we have shame and guilt that's unresolved in our lives. See, what we're talking about is we want to get to hunger, but before we can get to hunger for righteousness, we've got to get, a, get, a, get rid of what's gnawing us and eating us alive inside. And shame and guilt damages relationships. We'll avoid commitment. If there's shame, if I get too close to people, if I open myself up to people, they're gonna see all my junk. They're gonna know where, you know, my hurts and my hangups, my habits. They're gonna, they're gonna see past the, the closet. And so we keep our distance. We build barriers from other people to avoid relationships. And one of the reasons is guilt. Number three, it steals my future by chaining me to the worst in my past. That's what guilt and shame does, is it chains us to the worst of our past. So it steals my future because I'm, I'm chained to this failure, to this regret, to this hurt of my past, and I can't move on because it keeps pulling me back. Do you know some experts have said 70, as much as 70% of physical illness is directly related to unresolved guilt. That unresolved guilt, like it, it physically affects our body. Back pain and stress, hypertension, headaches, and on and on are related to this emotional thing, this spiritual thing that we're carrying that has us chained to the worst of our past. We can't bury it. This is scary, right? It's scary to get to this place where you're like, I can't keep burying this because when I swallow it, it eats me alive. If I just keep swallowing it, it's going to gnaw at my, it's going to eat me alive. So how do I get rid of it? How do I acknowledge it? So I need to create a hunger by releasing, by letting go of my faults. 
How do you do that? I've got to get, I've got to, if I'm going to create a hunger for righteousness, I've got, to, I've got to get rid of these faults. I've got to release them. I've got to let go of the shame and the guilt. I've got to let go of it. But how? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> how many of you have a, at your house, you have a junk drawer? You know, and you're looking, maybe you got like 10 junk drawers. But you have that, that's just, just narrow it down to one, all right? You got this, this junk drawer, right? And you, you, there's a key that you want, there's a key to the shed that you're looking for. You never go to the shed, but you need to go to the shed. It's gonna probably be in the junk drawer, right? So you're in there, and there's some chapstick, and there's like sticky notes, and there's juicy fruit. And then <laughs> where the heck did all these paper clips come from? And Bayside pens, <laughs> like, bring our pens back, people. Bring it. Uh, so... And you're like up in there, you know, you like get your, you know, it's like maybe there's something way back there. Oh my gosh, that's a checkbook back there. Wow, that's what that is. You know, you're digging it. And, and, but you, don't you get to the point where you're like, okay, this is crazy. And you take the drawer out and what do you do? <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. There's that key. There's that key that unlocks the shed. If we're going to release the guilt, we got we to gotta dump the junk drawer. You got to take it out. And it's scary because you don't know what's going to bounce across the table. But you got to take it out and you got to dump it. And find out what those faults are, those guilt that is holding you back. So the first step in creating hunger is you got to empty out what's in there already. What's in there already is guilt. So you've got to empty out those faults. What does that mean? That means for some, quite literally, it means you need to write it down. You need to write it out. You need to sit down and make a note of the, the things that you've done that are just, you just can't let go of. They keep holding you back. I told you this was a courageous step. This is, you've got to have courage to do this. You've got you to be serious about it. You've got to mean it. If you really want to thirst for righteousness and stop being burdened by guilt. You've got to get serious and get rid of that hurt, that hang up, that habit that is holding you back. Write it down. This hurt, this broke me. This is something I'm ashamed of. Because when you swallow it, it eats you up. So you examine yourself, you empty it out. You, you're, you're specific. God, I, I've blown it. I regret what I did here. This was wrong. I said this. I did this. They did this. This hurt. And my response to it wasn't helpful. You've got to just write it out. Psalm 19 verse 12 says, How can I know the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Now, you got, but here's the thing. I, I got to tell you, you got to empty the junk drawer though. Like, because this is what we do. <laughs> we Pick the things out of the junk drawer we want to drop. Like, okay, yeah, that one, that one. This one, we're just going to leave right there. And there was a study by a Harvard Business Review that said those people who tell the half truth actually are worse off than those who didn't tell the truth at all. Like those, were only, those people who were only half honest actually were worse off than those who weren't honest at all. Why? Because there's this little gnawing voice that says, yes, but there's more to the story. Right? There's a little voice in our head and in our heart that says, that's not exactly what happened. That's not exactly how that went down. And you know it, and we know it. And so the Harvard, Harvard Business Review summed up the research this way. It says, confession is a powerful way to relieve guilt, but it only works if you tell the whole truth. You remember the story of the woman who, was, who had the issue of the flow of blood for 12 years and she wanted to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and she, she did. She fought through the crowd. She touched the hem of his garment and she was healed immediately. And then just what? She told him the whole truth. She told him the truth. She, she emptied it out. Here's what I've been going through. This is what's been happening. This is all, I've, all the suffering and pain and hurt I've gone through. Here it is. Here's the junk drawer, Jesus. I hope you can handle it. And he can. And he made her well. Second thing is you have to own all of it. 
You've got to own your faults. Because here's the temptation, right? You dump those hurts, hang-ups, habits out, and you're like, well, that was because of her, and that one, he did that, and yeah, but I was just having a bad day there, and I was tired, and we were in a financial crisis there, and pretty soon you're not responsible for any of it. You're just carrying, hypothetically, someone else's junk drawer. <laughs> but no, you got to own it. Like even if there's a hurt in your life and 95% of it was someone else, own the 5% that's yours. Own the piece of it that was yours, the part that, that you hung on to. Own it. It may have been mostly their fault, but own your part of it. Number three, ask God to forgive your faults. Ask God to forgive. So you dump them out, you own them. Yes, God, these, this is my junk. I've failed here. I've sinned here. This is, this is my junk. Would you please forgive me? And the scripture says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our, our sins and to cleanse us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah 1, 18 says, no matter how deep the stain of your sin is, I can take it out and make it clean as freshly fallen snow. As freshly fallen snow, no matter how deep the stain is. Remember the, wash it, the uh, dishwashing detergent or uh, laundry detergent that used to be? Takes the deep stains out, right? It's kind of like Jesus, right? He takes the deep, those ones that are just ground in so deep in your heart, it's like attached to your soul. And he forgives us. He goes deep. He cleanses. He relieves. He renews. We give it to him. Number four, we admit them to another person. You remember the James verse, right? Confess your sins one to the another so that you may be healed. There's something powerful about opening up to a friend and sharing a pain or a hurt. And admit them. Because the root of our sin, the root of our guilt is relational. And we need that relational connection. We need someone to hear and to say, you know what? You're forgiven. You're loved. You can move on now. You don't have to continue to be chained to the past. We need someone to look us in the eye and say that to us. Because back in the back of our minds, we don't think it really can apply to us. It's that relational connection a brother or sister in Christ who can speak life into you and hear your hurt and hear your pain and hear your failure and affirm to you that God forgives. Number five, accept God's forgiveness and forgive yourself. Accept God's forgiveness and forgive myself. Some of you may like feel right now like, man, Terry's like talking to me. I don't know why he's got to point me out in front of all these people. <laughs> if that's you, like, I'm not pointing you out. We all, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter three says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word of God says, there is not one righteous, no, not one. And so when we admit, when we own our sin, when we own our failures, when we own our guilt, our regrets, I mean, some of us, we just, we have enough regrets just in our parenting to fill up a junk drawer. Right? Like, I, man, I blew it there. I lost my cool there. I said I should not have said they're going to need counseling for that one. I mean, I should have. Just in that arena alone, we filled up a junk drawer. In our marriage, we, there's a junk drawer full of offenses in marriage, in friendships, in business relationships. There's so, like, they're, they're emptying them out and it gnaws at us. And we wonder when bad things happen, oh, this is really like God just getting me back because I didn't, I have failed to acknowledge that thing back there. And so this is just God getting me back, which is a lie. But it's the way the enemy keeps us chained to our past. And then the, the way that services itself on the other side is when something good happens, you have this gnawing feeling that you don't deserve it. And it's temporary and he'll take it, he'll take it back in a second. Or he made a mistake. It was really supposed to go over here. You were in the wrong spot. 
because guilt and shame. So when we admit it, when we accept God's forgiveness, we accept that he's forgiven us, then I forgive myself. I let it go. We empty the guilt. Then we're ready to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Then we can hunger and thirst for what is good. We've got to get rid of that guilt because what happens is when we have guilt in us, it distorts our hunger. And we start hungering for things that are not good for us. We start hungering, we think we're hungering for things that are, that are not good for us. What we're doing is we're hungering for righteousness, but we're being filled with things that are counterfeit. You remember when you were a kid, like um, your, your mom or dad would have like cookies or brownies on the counter and it'd be close to dinner time and they would say, don't eat that brownie, it'll spoil your dinner. It'll spoil your appetite. And I'm thinking, isn't that the point? <laughs> like, I'm hungry, I want it to spoil my appetite. <laughs> But they're smarter than we were, right? Because they know that, yes, you have an appetite, you have a desire for it to be filled, but that's not really what you need right now. What you really need is something that's going to last, that's going to add substance to your life, that's going to that's be healthy and good for you. So while that brownie looks, smells nice, that's not what you need to fulfill the hunger in you. You need a meal. And so Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They want righteousness. They empty out the junk drawer. When you empty out the junk drawer, then you're ready to be filled. But you can't be filled until you empty the junk drawer out. It'll just be moving things around until you empty it out. So when it comes to receiving from God, and this is the amazing thing about the beatitude is it's, it's, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who hunger and thirst are blessed. So it's not, and this was counterintuitive. This was counter to what they had understood about things of God. It was the way it was understood prior to what Jesus said in this beatitude was this. The righteous are blessed. Do you see the difference? The righteous are blessed. Jesus didn't say blessed are the righteous. Blessed are those who've got it together. Blessed are those who are perfect. Blessed are those who've cleaned up. Blessed are those who've got it, in everything in order. Blessed are those folks. Blessed are the righteous. No, Jesus said, blessed are those who know they aren't righteous, but they hunger and they thirst for it. Blessed are those who don't come before God with their righteousness, but they come before God with their junk drawer that has been poured out and they say, fill me. Blessed are those folks who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So I bring to God not my righteousness. I bring to God my emptiness. And when I do that, I'm filled. Then I thirst for righteousness. Then I, as a psalmist would say, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. God speaking through the, through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55 says this, come all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk with my, with, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest fare. What is God saying? He's saying, don't, the things external are not going to fill you up. What will fill you up is the things of God. Longing and thirsting for his righteousness. Righteousness comes only one way. It comes through Jesus Christ. We don't come to God righteous. We come to God through the righteousness of Jesus who makes us righteous. We come longing with our empty junk drawer saying, fill me. Romans 3, verse 21 says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. We come to Jesus empty and he makes us righteous. And as we long for him, he will fill us. But you've got to empty the guilt. You've got to empty out the junk drawer. I wonder if there's some folks in here who are ready to empty the junk drawer. Let me invite you to stand with me as we pray. There's some folks in here who are tired of carrying the guilt and the shame that's gnawing away at your relationships, that's gnawing away at your confidence, that's gnawing away at your future. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who come to God with their emptiness. You'll be filled. Maybe today is a day to confess that to God. That thing, that failure, that issue, that hurt, to to face it and confess it. He says he'll forgive you, he'll cleanse you, but you gotta acknowledge it. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace. You are a good father, better than any earthly father, full of love and compassion and grace. You who desires our best, our wholeness, our wellness. God, maybe there are some today who are carrying guilt and shame. God, you said if we confess it, if we acknowledge it, you would forgive us. And God, maybe there are some in this place today that need to be forgiven, redeemed, renewed, restored. If that's you this morning, can you just let me pray for you by raising your hand saying, Terry, I'm just tired of carrying the guilt and the shame. Would you pray for me? I see you and you and you. I see you and you. I can see you over there and you back there. I see you right here. You and you. Anybody else? I see you right there. Lord, for my friends who just lifted their hands saying, I'm tired of carrying this weight. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who said, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. So God, we, we cast them on you. And some of these we've been carrying a long time. It was our worst moment, our worst decision, our most embarrassing moment. We hand it to you, God. We empty the junk drawer at your feet. We ask you to forgive us. We don't make excuses. We don't pretend it didn't happen. We don't write it off as anything else than our sin. We own it. We thank you that you love us and that you promised that if we confess it, you would forgive us. So we take your forgiveness. We receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for all of our sins, for everything in everyone's junk drawer. You paid for it. Thank you. God, would you help us to to love ourselves and to forgive ourselves? Would you give us the courage to admit it to a friend so we can release this once and for all? God, help us to hunger and thirst for the future, for a righteous future for ourselves and for others. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit to help us each to be loving and righteous. Not self-righteous, but empty and righteous. God, thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you for the authentic move of your spirit that is happening deep, deep in us. We thank you for that. We pray that we would hunger and thirst more and more as a deer pants for the water. May our souls long for you. God, I pray your blessing and your wholeness and your healing over every person today. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you today. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. If you need someone to pray with you, someone to talk with you, I'll be up here at the front. I'd be more than glad to do that with you before you leave this morning. Go in peace.